we actually need to love. We need it. It's not optional. And so when we take the cheap road that says, you people have shown us for 500 years that you refuse to acknowledge the truth. You refuse to work with us to bring about true equality. It is easy to say, therefore, I don't have to love you. But when we do that, we are actually hurting ourselves because the need to love is greater than the need for revenge. The species is at a choice point. Will this be our evolutionary crash or our evolutionary leap? My name is Gibran Rivera. I'm a facilitator, and this is my podcast. Here, I invite you into a conversation with remarkable leaders who are devoting their life to the evolution of consciousness and culture. In this episode, I introduce you to my friend Isoke Femi. Please know, as you listen, that our souls are definitely connected. Isoke is an imaginal practitioner. She's the primary facilitator and the founder of Soul Matters. She has more than 30 years of experience doing the deep work of transformation. Isoke is the co-founder of the Todos Alliance Building Institute, as well as the co-author of No Boundaries, a manual for unlearning oppression and building multicultural alliances. But she's also so much more than that. I experience Isoke as a fountain of wisdom and as a woman of deep, deep courage. She's a channel. She makes herself available to the movement of energies that would otherwise remain only in our subconscious. She holds culture and spirit with an incredibly humble and even vulnerable form of power. I met Isoke through her work at Bali, the business alliance for local living economies, where we are privileged to facilitate a two-year fellowship. I cannot wait for you to get to know Isoke and to get a feel for the spirit that this woman brings. Enjoy the podcast. Isoke, so good to be with you. I have been looking forward to this for a long, long time. Thank you and welcome to my podcast. Thank you, Gibran. I'm thrilled to be here finally too. Yes. And there's so much to talk about, so much to chat about. Um, worth noting that we have had the blessing of working together, uh, specifically supporting a fellowship that that you started, that you pretty much created uh, for Bali, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies. And that has been really beautiful and powerful work to do together. Yeah. Well, it was a co-creation, um, as all great creations are. Um, and so I've been, I was really happy to be part of that, that group of um, explorers, you could say. And it's been great to work with you. Um, you know, at some point we could talk about what I've learned from you, but I've learned a great deal from you mm. as a facilitator, as a human being. Um, you're in my thoughts frequently. It's okay, similarly. Similarly, you, you you have really influenced my life and you continue to. And uh, there's an authenticity and a boldness to your path uh, that is rooted in a story that is so powerful that I just couldn't wait for uh, my listeners to, to get to know you a little bit better. And I would love you to say a couple of words about soul matters and this life project that you are holding right now? I'd love to. Soul Matters is an organization whose name reflects my deep desire to acknowledge the centrality of soul in doing our work, 
in doing psychological work and doing political work and doing relational work and in our play. Um, the soul is that organ of being that feels. It is that organ of being that experiences deeply. It is not the transcendent function. It is the embodied, particular, in the moment, in the flesh aspect of our experience. So we don't say no to the heart or to the spirit or any of that. We want all of it, but we start from the place of giving soul what it needs because in our culture, it is what is most deprived of what it needs. Wow. That is a powerful assertion. And I remember uh, before when I was hearing, heard, heard the word soul matters and uh, just being in relationship with you, it, it, it seemed really big. And I, and I know that it is. Part of what struck me uh, the last time we, we talk about it more deeply is how you you spoke about it as rooted in culture and in and in your and your experience of your own culture uh can you say a little bit more about that sure i mean <laughs> i could make this whole conversation be about that but i won't um, <laughs> yeah like i think that everybody on some level most people who have had any exposure to black culture or black cultural elements would have no trouble um, reaching the point of understanding that Black culture is rooted in a particular relationship to soul. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the longer I live, the more I think about it, the more I think, well, sometimes one's relationship to soul is best clarified under d duress. So here we have in the diaspora, people who were stripped of everything, right? Um, of the of worldly value, of name, of place, of family, of um, autonomy, of material wealth, and not only deprived of those things, but also then in addition told that their worth was little to nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, but from this group sprang cultural gems, treasures, right? Because it was like, that is what you have available to you. You're stripped down to the bone. And so then you have to turn to something that's not physical, something that's not of this world, something that's not dependent on your state of um, freedom of or lack thereof. So to me, you know, Black folks found freedom in ways that defy all we know about liberty and um, and and material freedom. Wow, 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 wow! I uh, I am so every time you speak of this. Uh, Something in me shakes, right? Because there's a, such a deep, deep resonance. Uh, so then tell me a little bit about the application of that lesson that your people hold, right? Or that medicine that your people hold in the context of, of soul matters. Okay. Yeah. So um, many people have written about what you might call Black cosmology or Black consciousness. And a lot of people who partake in African-American styles of uh, expression and cultural um, uh, artistry don't know these things, right? So I'll just, I'll name a few of them. So one of them is personalism. This is a belief that everything in the universe is personal and you relate to everything. So I like to tell this story about a cousin who had, they had roaches in their house. And, you know, anybody who's dealt with roaches, you know, they come out at night and they come out when you turn the light on. That's right. Um, and so I was there one day and 
all during the day we had visited with some other people who came to visit. And right around dusk, a couple of roaches came out and everybody ignored them. And when the other company left, my cousin took off a shoe, you know, and she went to one of the roaches and smashed it. And she was like, I told you about coming out here when I got company. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Like there's this way in which everything is animated. So animation is another aspect of black consciousness. That mm. that you're not dealing with a dead universe. You're dealing with aliveness and anything can be given aliveness through personalism. Um you just relate to things. You relate to things and to people and to places as if they have personhood. And this makes life a lot more interesting, right? Um, so we have personalism, we have aliveness, we have um, the interconnectedness of all things. Right. So, for example, uh, there's this notion in Bantu cosmology that's called force, soul force, right? So you have force, a place has force, things have force, people and gods have force. Um, and even style is a force. So like, if you know, you just see people with their swagger, that's a force. That's why you practice bringing like, who are you? How can you bring your force to bear on any situation? Right? So it's like how you move your body, how you accentuate your words. Um, people get known for certain things that they say and they say them in a certain way. Right. Right. Um, this all becomes sort of your, your trademark, a part of the force, the force field that you develop um, as a human being. So um, this interrelating came into play in slavery because slave master said, you are a thing. Right. Now, the, the enslaved people didn't necessarily remember that they have this uh, belief in force, soul force, but their reaction to this uh, idea that you are a thing was, well, even a thing is a force. Wow. <laughs> right? right and of course. Nothing but the highest force can eliminate force. So as long as we're here, we are going to be a force. I'm it may sure. be that we have to hide that force from you. It may be that we have to go find a place in the in 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 nature to express our force, but we are not letting go of the fact that we are forces. Wow. The, the, this is so potent. And uh, what, what I'm also no noticing and loving is the way, the way you come to life as you express this. And what it tells me is, right, that there is a deep love for your people, right? To yes. observe, to notice, and to witness, which also tells me, right, in there, there must be a love of self, right? Because you mm. are this, you are that. And so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What, yeah what you're right. You're right. It's like, you are right. And this is a really potent and important point because we suffer under the weight of centuries of oppression. And that oppression has, a, has left a mark on us. Uh, many different kinds of marks on different people, depending on circumstances. But when we get reminded, and perhaps this is why this Black cosmology has had such a pull on me, because I feel its medicinal power. Right. And if we name it, and we're specific about it, and we make a commitment to it, it's even more potent right. than when we just sort of kind of know it's there but we don't talk about it and we don't um, bring it together, bring it together. Uh, what's the word? Consolidate the knowledge in a certain way. So I'm really grateful for you saying that right now. Yes, love. And interestingly, part of the unspoken contract for the African in the diaspora, especially in the U.S., has been you are not allowed to love each other. To love each other is a violation of a contract that was imposed from outside, right? So do not gather, 
do not ever name this love that you have for each other. Because even, you know, like I think Black Lives Matter is an example of this. When when the moment someone says Black Lives Matter, there's a cacophony of response that's like, well, what about this life? And what about that life? And what about these other lives? People don't realize that they've been indoctrinated into a fear of of having Black people love each other. That's right. That's right. You know, and it, it, did you say gathering? It even it even comes to this supposed uh, quote unquote anti gang measures that this city's passed, right? That are meant to keep this wow. young man from hanging, from just being uh. together in their neighborhood. Uh. It, it's active now. It's happening today. Uh, thank you for 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 kind of making that link. Part of what I would love to hear about, right, is um, you know it's quite possible that. You came out of the belly, kind of lit with this soul and this awareness. But I imagine that uh, that it took some getting to. So I'm a little bit curious about how how does Isoke become Isoke, right? How did you how did you end up devoted to this to this calling? Hmm. What can you share about your early life? Well. I mean, that is the question of questions. And uh, I could answer it purely from a sort of sociological um, perspective or even a psychological perspective. But I think there is a metaphysical perspective to it as well. Um, That I, I, you know, like I came here to do something. That's as much as I'll say about the metaphysical part. But it's like, No, it was not an accident that I came into the family, the community, um, the situation that I came into. So I was born in Western Edition, San Francisco. Um, We didn't call it Western Edition. We called it Filmo, uh, which is uh, a contraction of Fillmore. Because Fillmore Street uh, is the central artery through that community that I grew up in, but we called it Filmo. And um, at age 11, I was taken away and placed in a Catholic boarding school that had hardly any black people there. And I wasn't raised Catholic. So it was a total cultural shock for me to be in that place. Um, And I could say that most of my life has been about trying to weave some unique tapestry from these two very distinct experiences Um, to bring into the white middle class context a deeper appreciation for where I came from and to bring back home that which is uh, potentially healing from, from the white lands, you could say. Got it. Um, so I, I see the beauty and the and the pathos in each. I have been a bridge. I, I came here, I believe I came here to be a bridge between cultures of various kinds. Um, and in order to do that, you have to have a bit of an anthropology um, interest in your soul, in your mind, in your heart. So <laughs> I was always the one. Everybody else would go outside. They're playing football, baseball, whatever, softball, whatever they're playing. And I'm hanging out just outside the living room where all the adults are talking. Because for whatever reasons, what they were talking about was important for me to know. I also, I, so I was, I've been the observer in my culture a lot, mm-hmm. um, which I think puts me just a tiny bit outside the center but makes me a great spokesperson. Um, and similar for, for my, my forays into whiteness, the same kind of thing. Like I'm not fully in uh, and I can speak very, very lovingly and clearly about what's there. Beautiful. So this interest in, I can remember being young and our community had some of everything. It had, um, Drugs and not that many drugs, really. It was more alcohol. I think the biggest drug when I was growing up was marijuana. And that was like, ah, terrible, terrible. Uh-huh. Um, but um, alcohol, 
um, a lot of violence and, you know, post-traumatic stress, we'd say now, post-traumatic slave syndrome issues that we didn't know how to address, except through church. Um, And so to me, the colorfulness of that, I wrote a dissertation on this, like um, the beautician, the wino on the corner was just had as much authority as the preacher in the pulpit when, when it came down to the actual in the moment, who can get your attention, who can turn um, the, the conversation in such a way that you go, dang, they know what they're talking about. Whoa, I can feel that. So this whole thing, like, uh, it's, a, it's a very Black thing to say, can you feel me? Right. You know, this thing, when I can feel you, I know there's something authentic here. You can stand on a stack of uh, books and reference materials uh, and say, so-and-so said it, and so-and-so said it, and so-and-so said it, and so-and-so said it, and that's what gives me authority. And the Black um, rap singer on the corner who maybe didn't even go past sixth, seventh grade would like, I don't care what your, what your books say. I can't feel you. So if I can't feel you, then what you're talking about doesn't mean anything to me. Wow. And th- th- when these these cultural styles come into contact, they're, they're, it's often there's a misunderstanding because in white middle class culture, we're taught to tamp down our emotions, not trust them because they make us I- irrational and unre- unreasonable. In black culture, you depend on these same things to help you know if something is true or not. So, right, they're like our navigational tools of sorts. Yes, yes, right? Yeah, exactly. So you, you're more likely to trust your intuition. You're more likely to uh, judge a person on, and it's not that you can't misjudge. Lots of misjudging happens because if a person is really masterful with their ability to get people into a feeling state, they can, they can actually lead them to some bad places. But, um, but in general, it's trustworthy. This this uh, this GPS, this inner guidance system, is trustworthy um, around the feeling. You can trust how you feel. You may not trust the story you put to that feeling, but you can trust the actual feeling. And is this then going back to this uh, this soul essence that you are that you're working with at Soul Matters? Is that is that the yeah. same energy? Well, okay, so when I left home and I was out here kind of feeling lost a bit, Mm -hmm. I realized in graduate school, I had the good fortune of going to a graduate school that placed soul at at the center of psychology's concern because actually psyche is soul. It's not mind. It's not behavior. Psyche is soul. And so... When I found that school and I saw that one of the teachings was to restore experience, the ability to have an experience, we get so numbed out through the educational system and through you know various other methods that we, we lose our capacity to even have an experience, right? You can feel it, this numbing out, this, this deadness that happens. Um, so when I found this school that said we're putting soul in the center and we're using expression and we're st- restoring experience, I was like, that is my school. And, and I might add my church because I couldn't, I could no longer abide by what was happening in Christian churches, but I love the soul that was there sometimes. Here I found, oh, I can have the soul and I can have freedom from the dogma that I find problematic. Well, wow, that sounds amazing. Uh, I, I don't know that there's a lot of graduate schools that are like that. Can you say, can, do you have a, a story of a moment in, in that education, that graduate school education that captures this essence? Like, oh, absolutely. I have so many, so many. So we had a cohort model. We would come to school on Friday morning and we'd be there until Sunday evening. And one evening, our teacher, our main teacher, the founder of the school, um, 
was upset because someone had sang a song um, of appreciation to the kitchen staff. That part was fine. We were, that was fine. But the person who sang the song sang it and it was loaded with a sort of uh, missionary, um, white liberal, painful. It was painful to sit through this song as this person is singing about a, a, a kitchen staff who is an elderly woman who is arthritic and you can tell like it takes everything out of her to come and do the dishes and all this stuff. And he sang about her in a way that was very disrespectful, but mm-hmm. he didn't know it. He thought he was respecting her. Then the teacher waited until the end of the weekend to give us a lesson about that. And he started off by having us walk around the campus and pick up anything we saw that would, that wasn't supposed to be there, cigarette butts or wrappers from candy or whatever, and in silence. And we followed him like ducklings all over that campus in silence doing this until he had us in a mental state where we were very, very much rooted in something other than our heads. We ended that procession in the kitchen He stood where that woman washes dishes. And he said, I just, just a few more and I can go home. Just a few more dishes and I'm, I'm, I'm done. And we all began to cry, but I remembered Sweet Honey in the Rock. And I started singing. Mm -hmm. Washing the floors to send you to college, staying at home so you can feel safe. And that was the ritual moment where no words could ever describe what we got to. This deep, deep, deep understanding of the the sorrow, the beauty, I even words escape me even now as I try to tell the story. Um, where else could I do that? Where else could I go in the world and have my graduate school educational experience be one like that? Wow. Wow. What is, there's so much potency in, in what you're saying. What I want to name is something that's happened for me as, as you share, as you sang, it was like the energy moved through my whole body, right? Like I, I had goosebumps all over and there was a, a direct transmission, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the understanding that you were able to cultivate was such that, that, that with these words and with this just brief moment of song moved into me, right? Yeah. And, 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 and so there is... It's a whole other way. It's a whole of other sharing way. knowledge of sharing yes. understanding. Yes, it's transformative education versus informative education. You could have used a million words to try to get to that moment, and you would have failed. But when you let soul do it, right? So, what was Aftab doing in that moment? He was personifying the person. This is something we don't allow ourselves to do very much. Because in, under materialism run rampant, we think you can't speak somebody else's voice. You may get it wrong, whatever, right? But he took the liberty of speaking as Rosa, mm-hmm. this woman who's probably 78 or 80 years old, still washing dishes mm-hmm. for a bunch of college students. He stood there and he gave voice to what he imagined her experience to be. And that opened us because that that's the archetypal. You see, archetypally, we can all relate to just one more dish, just a few more minutes and I, I'm done. Hmm. Now, we may never have washed dishes. We may come out of a, a, a class context where the privilege prevented us from ever learning how to do that. But even a person like that can be can be reminded on a soul level that there's something here I know I recognize this I recognize the truth in this moment even if I'm not the one washing the dishes mm. wow 
So he personified Rosa. That opened up in me this cultural space of like the power of song to bring it home, to bring it home and to express what the soul needs to express. Yeah. I, I, have, I have been blessed uh, to see you practice uh, this personification, right? There's a, there might be an energy moving in the room. There might be, uh, yeah, an energy or a part, a part of you, a part of us uh, that is somehow being suppressed. And I've seen you stand up and just kind of speak for that in, in this way that that changes things yeah right yeah right it, it moves us outside of this kind of like bourgeois constraints and towards an entirely different kind of it's a whole other tool for moving for for communicating for i'm out of words but uh what can you tell me about that practice mm, yeah um my teacher used to say to me uh, Isoke, you set a new bar for expressing subjectivity. Wow. And so I wanted to bring that in, that, that concept, that phrase, expressing subjectivity. Modernity said you can't trust subjectivity. So you have to put all your eggs in the objectivity basket. Now, many of us know and knew that you can't really have objectivity. If you decide to do research on a topic, there is some subjective reason usually at the base of that desire. There's desire. There's some, the desire to know. Um, and we were taught that research, researchers hid their subjective investment in their research. And so we all kind of got marched along with this idea that to really be smart, to really be uh, credible, to really be have efficacy, you have to be objective. Um, but there are certain things that cannot be known that way. The subject has to be able to express. The subject has to be able to speak. And so uh, subjectivity is another way of looking at this thing of, that we call um, personification. You let the subject have its space. This doesn't just mean letting the subject speak and you hear the content of it, right? So for instance, if I say, if I try to get objectivity to mediate my subjective experience, I, I'm right away in trouble. So for instance, if someone says, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Well, I keep coming to this one for some reason. I've talked about this before. When the last uh, presidential election cycle ended and we, and we ended up with Donald Trump as president, um, I heard people say many, many things that, were dis that they were full of anger and disgust and fear on, on our side. But there was something missing for me. And I kept saying, there's something missing. And it's, it's, this, it's the subjectivity. People are not actually expressing their subjectivity. They're mediating it through some other kind of channel. Wow. I'm like, well, what would that look like for me? What is my subjective experience of this moment? And uh, there are several, but the one that keeps coming back to me is like, um, they're really going to take our country somewhere really scary. Like, this is scary. This is the nine-year-old, the six-year-old, the, 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 the unprotected group. I'm part of an unprotected group. I'm scared. Mm -hmm. What is going to happen to us? This voice couldn't come because you have to be so sophisticated. You have to cover that vulnerability. You have to hide it. You have to do something to make it look not pathetic because we've all been convinced that it's not cool to look pathetic, right? Wow, it's okay. But I believe that the pathetic, the feeling of the pathetic one has to be there for the solution to be found. You can't exile those parts. 
It's okay. You are giving me such a gift right now, such a big and important gift. Thank you for it. And I, I'll share some words about this. I too have been frustrated with with the reaction and with, and with what it has allowed, right? And I have not had the language that you have. Where, where I've turned to is kind of being upset and feeling outside of my own tribe, even if I politically agree with it, right? Yes, and, yes. And w- w- the way I have articulated it with now feels limited is, it's like we have given ourselves license to be hateful. Yes. Right. Yes. Something bad is happening. And somehow now we get to other the right now we get to make the other person bad, the yes. other people bad. We get to ignore it, 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 a whole half. You know, I hope it's not half of the country. It's not the majority, but we get to vilify mm-hmm. the other. I remember an article that that was sent around soon after the election. And. It was all over my feed because it was resonating with people. And the the headline was something like, don't ask me to empathize with the white working class. Now, what? I, 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 part of me, so my reaction is the same as yours, but then I'm like, okay, wait a second. White supremacy just came and kicked us in the face. And the entire political establishment is saying, oh, my God, we better pay attention to white working people, right? So there was something of substance there, right? Something Mm -hmm. important Mm -hmm. to note. Yes. But I also noted the moment my stance is don't ask me to empathize, I already lost. I already lost a part of my humanity, right? Yes, yes. Now, I have been in this grappling, in this wrestling with this kind of energy or vibration that is moving through social movement spaces that holds that kind of negativity, that that kind of thing that that I feel is is losing before before we even consider winning, losing too much in the process. Uh, But what I have not understood is what you just shared, that Really what it is, is this, this authentic, deep fear, this ancestral wound, yeah. right? This thing. And that what we are doing with it is acting out. Yes. Right? And we would rather, like, in the process of exiling that part of ourselves that you have called pathetic, we are, what it yields is kind of exiling whole parts of our country. Yes. Right? Whole, and so you have just given me a very powerful lens by which to 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 be with my frustration and to to kind of turn it back into a level of compassion yeah and that's it's the here's the thing i mean thank you for for saying that we actually need to love Ache. we Amen. need it it's not optional <laughs> It's not optional. And so when we take the cheap road or the easy road that says, you people have shown us for 500 years that you cannot, will not refuse, you refuse to acknowledge the truth. You refuse to work with us to bring about true equality, true equity, whatever you want to call it, just just love, like a loving community. It is easy to say, therefore, I don't have to love you. But when we do that, we are actually hurting ourselves because the need to love is greater than the need for revenge. When I don't love, it's like I damn up the 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 I damn up my own soul. Something gets sick inside of me when I don't let the love flow. It doesn't mean that I agree. It doesn't mean that I think that um, there shouldn't be accountability. And this is something I want to come back to because if it's okay with you, I want to bring in this, this, because I know that we've all struggled with this, you know, various of us have struggled with this. So I want to acknowledge that temperamentally I am 
a person who leans more toward forgiveness than accountability. If we were to put those on two ends of the spectrum, it's a false dichotomy, but let's just for the sake of talking about it, put them there. On one end, you have this forgiving nature that says, no matter what, I will love you. On the other extreme, you have, I cannot love you until you are accountable. In fact, love has nothing to do with it. Accountability first. Right. Now, my temperament would automatically pull me away from that extreme. I'm a nine on the Enneagram. I'm an Aquarian. I'm who knows what other things go into making me be this kind of softy. I'm kind of more like a Rodney King kind of person. (laughs) Not that I can't raise hell. I've raised a lot of hell in my life, but usually I'm going to be trying to avoid, you know, heavy conflict. All I've right. seen you in action though. Yeah, yeah, you have. <laughs> um, so I, I, but, but I, but in my reaction to the, ex- the other extreme, I find myself not being able to make my way back to my tribe, as you call it. I can't make my way back to my tribe because they're too unforgiving. All right. So I work at Glide Church part-time, Glide Church in San Francisco which in the 80s developed an approach to uh, crack cocaine recovery that was pretty awesome. The 12-step programs at the time didn't understand the drug. They were very white and middle class in a lot of ways. And people, Black people in the Tenderloin found that they couldn't find uh, comfort in those 12-step meetings. So they came to Cecil Williams, who was the founder, uh, found one of the founding ministers at Glide, and they said, "Cecil, this drug is destroying our communities. We need help. What can we do?" He said, "I don't know. Let's just come together and meet." They met over time, and they came up with a an approach to recovery that has been very powerful for a lot of people, and it's rooted in this black sensibility that says, "It's opposite of no crosstalk." It's like, no, we are a call and response culture. We are going to respond to you, but we are going to respond to you from a place of absolute conviction and absolute commitment. I'm committed to you no matter what. You are like my brother. You are like my sister. And I am not going to... um, abandon you. Okay. So the whole group is given permission to hold that value. So, you know, maybe I might think I'm coming at you like you're my beloved brother or sister, but I might actually be sending a barb toward you. The rest of the group has permission implicitly and explicitly to say, "Uh uh-uh, Isoke, that had something in it other than love. You need to fix how you, how you just gave that feedback. Wow. (laughs) So it's accountability with commitment. That's it. What we see in these circles these days is like, there's not, the commitment piece is not there. Like you'll have to earn my commitment first. That's right. Whereas this other one, this glide recovery uh, um, value, modality, whatever you want to call it, says no, we start from the place of commitment. Yes, yes. And yeah, in no, fact, I will not even give you feedback unless I'm committed to you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, it's, it, we, we do the opposite. We, it's, exile is going to be the default. Yes. Right? Yes. And, in, and, and I've often compared it, you know, I grew up in, in a church. It was, it was a Catholic church, but it was something called the charismatic renewal. Mm-hmm. And so it was as Pentecostal as you could get. <laughs> While it's remaining really Catholic. Catholic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it was just, you know, people get got up and gave testimony, right? Mm-hmm. And they said, you know, I, the people, they had already made a commitment to living a life of God, right? Yes, yes. Right? So they would either, the testimony would take one of two shapes. It could be a testimony of my past was wretched and now... I'm saved, yeah. right? That's yeah. the the storyline that we are all that is bringing everybody together. But the fact is that each one of us fails, right? After, 
after yes. you're on the path, right? Yes, yes. And so then you would get up and give this money and say, I was tested, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. And I, and I failed, yes. right? And in our current context, people don't even have the, the safety, the permission to talk about the failures. There's no so, room for redemption. There's, there's no, no room, room for redemption. Re- redemption. And thank you for that word, redemption. Yeah. Because in, what I'm proposing out there right now is that we're going to, I call my work alliance building. Uh, I still use the alliance building model. I, I know that there are better ways, but that's what I kind of cut my teeth on and it still works for me. Um, and so in our alliance building, we've moved to this place of saying, Bring your frailties, bring your failings, and bring your forgiveness. The three F's, right? So failings, frailties, and forgiveness are are welcome here. We are all, I mean, um, one of my issues with how we do the social justice work in the world is that we, first of all, we could be, we, we become one or two issue focused so that we oftentimes find ourselves on what we call the target side of the oppression, which means that we don't get to work on where are we non-target because that's where we develop the compassion. When we can see, I'll just use being an ally to Jews as an example. I know that could raise a lot of ire for people, but that's a decision I made. 40 years ago. Beautiful. To be an ally to Jews. Okay. Um, When I'm with other African-American people who are running anti-Semitism, that is when it's the hardest for me to stand up and say no, or to stand up and say, you know, this doesn't feel good. Or I have a different experience of that because the fear of losing my connection to my quote unquote, my people is that strong. That's Unless right. I have that experience, I can't understand when white people can't do it. Wow. Wow. I went, I had not even, I could not even have it. Wow. What an, what an important insight. It's, okay. it's so important. That's why we have to work on where are you not, uh, where are you privileged? You could say, right? We're always pointing out everybody else's privilege. Where are you privileged and unable to step up to the plate, the way that you're asking X group or Y group to step up. We need that. We need it. It gentles the heart a little bit. Agreed. And I think it shows up a lot in um, in the spaces where I, I, am, I, I am 100% sure because what's interesting is if I raise a concern about the kind of this spirit of uh, language policing, this kind of thing that happens... Nobody, you know, people don't say much in the circle, but then they come around the side and they say, you know what, thank you for saying that. I agree. <laughs> and, and, and what is what it's saying is people are just all of us, we're creatures of belonging. Yes, yes. And what we fear is exile from the tribe. Yes. Yes. And in this time when we don't know when when our community is really an abstraction, right? It's this idea as opposed to this experience then you just fear. You're just afraid to say, you know what, that that language, that kind of like constant hateful language that that just puts other people down because they have oppressed us for 500 years. I don't, I, I'm not feeling that, right? Yeah. It, it becomes impossible to say it, right? Yeah. yeah. Because, because you can, you're just not going to be cool. You're going to be exiled. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, it's okay. I, I'm kind of. This is coming to me from from an angle, and, and I know you can you can play with this. The other day, I went to my own uh, twelve step meeting, and I'm and I just go to different meetings depending on my time. I, I don't have a, a home group right now, and I went to the Iron Workers Local in South Boston. Whoa! Uh, and I, I was putting maybe one or two people of color, and I was with these white dudes. That are union work, union iron workers uh-huh. <laughs> of all ages, all of us, including me, right? Yeah. In the same struggle, right? Yes. In the same story. Yes. And I gotta tell you, aside from 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 what it does to 
to my process of recovery, it um, there was something in my soul, right? I, I, it was almost like between tears and elation that I was for for the first time, right, having this this deep, vulnerable, shared moment with these dudes that live in the same city that I have been in for 25 years, right? Yes. That I have otherized and they have otherized me. Yes. And I knew, right, that in that shared, deep, personal struggle, something powerful was happening, right? And none of it, none of this says uh, white supremacy is over, right? None of this right, says right. structural oppression is not real. But it is calling forth something way more human in me. It is actually liberating for me, yeah. for me, right? Yes. To be able to be in relationship like this. Yes. Right, with people who I share this much humanity with. Yes. I mean, and, and, and Gibran, I think part of it is, I said earlier that the need to love is greater than the need for revenge. I think also the need for freedom. You see, we we need to be free. And not just free from external oppression, but free from how we how that external oppression shapes our responses in life. Right? So you that's a declaration of freedom for you to allow yourself to have this fully human experience with a group of people who in another context may be your enemy. But in I certainly fact, would assume that, right? I would certainly assume that whether they're or not, I would make right, that right, assumption. Right, right, right. Or perhaps in a given context, they might act very differently in a way that was not as welcoming, right? right? Because of the belonging issue. Because now we're in a context where this is not 12-step anymore, right? This is whatever, you know? And I gotta, I gotta live here when you're gone, right? Whatever. But it doesn't matter. The point is that the need to be free from that baggage, even if it's just for an hour, even if it's just for a couple of hours, I think this is why the slaves danced and sang and laughed and played and the uneducated eye, the um, the eye that needed to see this in a certain way looked upon it and said, people like the experience of being enslaved. Look at them. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. You're just dropping so many gems here today. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, you know, it's okay. This kind of brings me back. I'm just looking at the time and there's one piece I want to get to. And, and I know, I just know you have the gift to, to weave it all together. But when we're talking about personification, uh, and now you're talking about about this this medicine, right? This dance medicine, right? Yes. I'm from the Caribbean, right? I'm from an Afro Latin country. In my island, right, Afro Latin spirituality is practiced, right? And and part of what happens in the Santeria is you literally embody, yes, you personify, yes, you personify yes. the Orisha, you personify the deity, yes. Right. And so this, this, can, can you just say a word about how that is connected to your work on soul matters and personification? Yes. Well, the first thing I want to say is that with the, with the, the way the church did that, the, especially in the South of the U S we lost the multiplicity of deities that could come down. And we ended up with just the Holy ghost which is fine. It's better than nothing. It's very <laughs> powerful, right? But we did we did maintain that connection to opening the head and allowing the Orisha to come in. It just got singularized as the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. So that's a bit of an aside. But um, we... One day, someone accused me of being willful and um, a loose cannon. And it was, it was a teacher. And um, he knew he'd given me a big, big piece of poison because I had quite strong projections of father on him. 
Um, and so he offered at, at the end, now you all can go and work on this as a group, or you can stay on the phone with me and I'll help you work through it, you know? And I chose to stay with the group. And we went into ritual right away. We went into ritual. My wife, who is uh, of 32 years, who is um, Portuguese, um, was the first one to come into the ritual space. And she came in. She didn't say who she was. She just embodied it. She came into the middle of the circle. And she said, you damn right I'm willful. When they were grabbing us up and putting us on ships and putting us in forts, I had to be willful. When they were throwing us overboard, when they were starving us, when they were, we had to sleep in our own shit, I had to be willful. And she did it like a preacher, right? She just embodied this black ancient soul. And as I listened to her, something in me just relaxed. People often say, um, I don't want to have to teach you. I don't want to have to show you how it feels. I don't want to have the burden of that. Well, when someone embodies, personifies your ancestor experience with such elegance and such pathos and beauty, it does relieve something inside. Like it's like what a, many of us crave for is thank God you actually get it. Mm. Thank God you actually get it. And I can, I don't have to sit here holding tight. I remember just feeling like something, like a load being taken off. So the power of personification is that it can, when used properly in ritual space, it can allow everything that needs to be said, everything that needs to be felt, every storm because that's the hardest part is the storming emotions that we are most afraid of, and rightfully so, because they do a lot of damage. But if you set a ritual frame that says, here, it is safe for these stormy, these stormy emotions, these stormy forces that are sometimes ancient, they can come into this space because we can hold it as a community. We can hold the container. So that's one of the ways that I think that personification is so important. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, uh, and I'm, I'm going to start to move us towards a close here, but I'll say as you speak and I, uh, as I feel the truth of your words, uh, I have a, a leadership uh, retreat uh, meeting. I got all the leadership session uh, to, to facilitate on Monday. And I, I'm going to pray over the weekend, right? I just wish I had the courage, right? I'm mean, even the skill to, to hold something like that because we would unlock so much more so much. than what we were going to be able to do otherwise. Uh, so, so you're sending me into the weekend with prayer. There, prayer for courage, prayer, prayer for wisdom and, and, and discernment. See if, if this yes. is something I could even come close to pursuing. Uh, there's a couple of questions uh, that I like to ask uh, at the end of this podcast. Uh, there's two. The first one is, it, it, comes, from, it comes from me uh, as a man uh, working to become a better man and to help uh, other men become better. And, and it comes out of a commitment to, uh, to garner the wisdom and the words of, of, of powerful, wise women such as yourself in these times. In this moment, um, when the, the Me Too movement has made clear and explicit what so many of us men and the power structure has wanted to hide from or even wanted to uphold, right? Uh, exposed in such an ugly way. There's all this ugliness, all this suffering, all this pains that we have caused. Um, and I include myself here. What, what should men do, Isoke? In your, what are your thoughts? What is your, what are your words of wisdom uh, for men that are trying and wanting to to make atonement and to make things better? Wow. Um, there are a couple of things. One, I think, is to address the trauma that men experience at the hands of other men. 
and at the hands of patriarchy. The conditioning that says kill or be killed. The conditioning that says don't be a wimp. The conditioning that says um, you're going to look like a fool if you're not in control. Uh, one of my male friends calls it the male role belief system. So to, to, to address the male role belief system and how it imprisons and how it does harm to men. That's one. The second thing I would say is um, I wish that we could have speak outs. Um, one of the elements of our approach to alliance building is the speak out. In the speak out, the so-called target group, in this case, women or people who identify as female or women, speak out to the men. And there are three key questions. Uh, what do you want your male allies to know about you? What do you never want to hear, see, or have happen again to you or other people in your group? And what do you expect from your allies to make a difference? So you would have a group of women stand up and speak out on those questions. And at the end, the men simply stand up one by one and say, I heard you say. And as close to word for word as possible, they say back what they heard. I heard you say you never want to be raped. I heard you say you want men to take more responsibility for the raising of kids. I heard you say that you want me to have more fierceness in my voice when I call our, call us out or call, not call us out because I don't want to move toward calling out, but you know what I'm saying? Like, I want you to bring more fierceness, more immediacy, more get in touch with how this is harming you. Yeah. So anyway, so the men speak back what they heard. That would be another thing that I would uh, ask. And then the, the last thing is really more for women. We, I believe, need to look at our projections onto men that we've been conditioned to put there. This abdication of personal power. Um, it, it's happened to all of us. We are magnificent beings. We are, we are not genders, actually. We are not genders. We are beings of great magnitude who can bring about the change of the world but not from a place of pure victimization. So I would ask us to, to challenge ourselves. Am I asking men to take 90% of the responsibility for turning this around, but I still want a ring on my finger? I still want, you know, the most expensive ring. I still want all these things that I've been conditioned to think I should get if someone loves me. Um, if you're if we're doing that, we need to look at it. We need to look at where we only want the changes to happen to a certain point. It's okay. You are so clear and so courageous and 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 so bold in in your speaking truth here. I am honored by it uh, and moved by it. Thank you. I'm you're listening. Welcome. And you really opened up a space. You know. Um, it's been said the, the student brings out the teacher, mm. right? Mm. And so there's a way that your openness and your enthusiasm and your trust bring out the best in me. So thank you. Beautiful. I love, I love this relationship that we have, and, and, and I know we're going to keep nurturing it. I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, <laughs> one more, okay? Okay. And, and, uh, and that is... It's a little bit of time traveling, so it requires a little consent because I'm taking you to, to a brief process. And what I'd like to do is invite you to time to travel to 10 years from now, right? Mm -hmm. And to picture your attainment, right? Given what you're working on, given what you're longing for, given your desire and your effort, um, given simply the process of experience and what life teaches us, right? And if you could visualize yourself 10 years from now, and if you could feel who you are then, who you are just from that place, what would you say to yourself now? 
Well done, my dear. <laughs> well done. You probably accomplished at least 70% of what you came here to do. Well done. And you really made great progress on your number one core issue, this belief that you couldn't stand on your own ground, that you couldn't defend your true, your deepest longings and your deepest commitments. You made great progress on that one. Well done. Whew, just bringing tears to my eyes. Um, what a gorgeous, what a gorgeous way. What a beautiful way. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for, my friend. Hmm, thank you, thank you, thank you. And just so you know, uh, we will put this out into the world and let people know where to find you. I think I think the world needs your gifts and your wisdom. Um, and you and they they only got just just such a small glimpse of all that you bring to a space. Uh, so I'm I'm. It is my prayer that people will be able to to find you and seek you out and get the blessing of of working with you and your gifts because you are holding something that we all need. 